Well, welcome everyone. Uh, today, Thursday, uh, another live session um, here uh, on Instagram. Uh, we've been doing this every night, uh, inviting people from the automotive industry. Um, I see you guys popping in. Thank you for watching. Um, last night, uh, it was, you know, a beautiful night. Um, thank you guys for watching. Um, and, uh, before we jump in on, on our guest today, um, of, uh, a couple things. One is the giveaway that we do have, uh, coming up tomorrow. So you have time until 8 p.m. to actually, uh, you know, tag your three friends in the comments. Just go through our post and find this one exactly or uh, on our Jose um, uh, page as well, which it is uh, LB underscore uh, model cars, double S. Um, and, you know, tag three friends and you are going to be uh, participating to win this uh, beautiful El Camino model car that he painted. Um, you know, this custom paint is fantastic. So um, for tomorrow... Uh, we're going to have Mr. Uh, Ron Flee, Fleenor tomorrow, so uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, right uh, before we, um, we're going to announce the, the winner for the giveaway, and right after, uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, the legend uh, and the custom world, um, so thank you, Ron, again, you know, to saying yes to this uh, Today, I know you guys have been excited about this one. Uh, let me just bring our guest. Let me find him here pretty quick. In the meantime, while he's connecting, uh, let me tell you guys thank you. We have Holly from Exalta. Wendy is here. Wendy, we got to reschedule uh, your <clears throat> live session with us. Uh, we have Oscar, we have Billy, we have Dominic, you know, from the shop. Thank you guys for joining tonight. Uh, Dr. Fusion, um, uh, we have a good body shop. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, let me see if we can bring us here tonight. <clears throat> Just a couple seconds here. I think we got it. Hey, Larry. How are you? Good. How you doing? Good, good, good. Thank you for being here tonight after hours, bothering you. That's okay. It's all good? All good. Anything related to the automotive is good? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, we could work it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, big time, you know, thank you for being here tonight, especially uh, we don't know each other in person. Um, uh, as basically anyone that has been here on this uh, live streams and I'm very grateful for everyone to say yes because the ultimate goal is to help each other and regardless who we are and all of that um, and um, you know again you know taking your time you know after hours um, many people here have no idea who you are you know uh, many people do know who you are uh, but for those who have no idea if you can briefly take, you know, tell us how are you related to the automotive industry and who is Larry Montanes? I, uh, I'm a sweeper and a uh, porter at a body shop. <laughs> I uh, just recently started there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, um, I'm a consultant in the, cons uh, in the industry with uh, Collision Hub. I have my own company called P&L Consultants. And I work for a forensic engineer doing accident reconstruction and uh, quality of repair assessments and stuff of that matter. I've written a bunch of magazines, co-wrote a book. So I've been involved in the uh, industry for over, uh, right now, 30, 30, 32 years now. So okay. 30, 30, 35 years, 35 years. Excuse me. Yeah, I've been involved in the collision repair business. Started uh after school, my first year of high school, working for uh, my mother's mechanic uh, after school every day. And then he'd drive me home after working for him for three hours. 
So I kind of started that way in this business. I was uh, started sweeping floors, and uh, then I uh, later got some training on welding, and I was a fabricator welder for the um, industry, and uh, moved myself along to become a manager, and eventually uh, taught some classes for iCar over uh, nine years, and then left that. And in 2001, I started p and Consultants with my partner, Pete, and we've been teaching ever since. Nice. So I thought that we have, you know, a lot to talk because of what you currently do. I didn't know much about your background. I assumed that you were in the industry forever and all that. Um, but we're going to go back and forth on that because I always want to know why did you get in the industry? You know, what it actually, you know, drive you through. And I was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> uh you know, uh, um, and anyone will tell you that. I, I I made Penn State. I made Pratt Institute. I made Cooper Union. Anyone who doesn't know what Cooper Union is, they should Google it and find out what it is, and you'll realize what an idiot I am. So uh, I'm involved in this business because I thought I knew better. <laughs> okay. So basically right out of high school, sweeping floors, and that was the start. Uh, in high school, I had a taste of doing some mechanic work, you know, cleaning up, doing, um, you know, doing some oil changes, uh, sending some body panels, doing stuff of that matter. And then uh, as time ran on, I, I learned some stuff from some older craftsmen, uh, metal work. And I, I mean, I started using lead when I first started in this business. I, I did chop tops and, and uh, um, C channels and then I was welding for a while. I was working for for a place that uh, welded chrome molly uh, 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 cages for um, you know for NHRA cars out of Englishtown, New, York, uh, New Jersey. But we were in New York, so okay. I, I was a fabricator to a certain extent. And I learned frame repair back in really technically its infancy in the '80s when I first started. I started the business in eighty, let's see, eighty four, and then full time was eighty six. Right when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have so much to ask you. You know, hope you have time tonight. No, uh, whatever you got, man. Go ahead, shoot away. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to go back and forth, you know, on your past, your present, the future of the company, Collision Hub, everything that is involved in your life. Um, first of all, you know, the current situation it is affecting your business. It's not affecting your business. You're operating normal. The whole COVID nineteen. It's where you are at right now. Um, my business. Uh, I, I would say suffered a little bit. You know, uh, 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 collision up suffered a little bit because we're not out with the five or six training classes we would normally have live with the classes. Obviously. Uh, you know, uh, one or two of the trade shows have been canceled uh, and or postponed. And, uh, you know, that, that, that hurt business a little bit. But then we got a little additive uh, bonus. We had some supporters that um, – sponsors that would pay for the training. So we might have done it for free, but we had somebody that was willing to pay um, for the overhead costs so that we could have some free classes for everybody over the past – um, two months, two and a half months, Kristen has uh, had a wide range of classes for everybody, um, you know, ranging anywhere in the shop and stuff. And uh, I've been doing a Larry rant uh, twice a week uh, on just stuff I've found on Facebook, things that were annoying me. Um, That's how I find you. <laughs> just a curse and scream uh, on there. Um, we still have our, our – uh, the nice thing is, is because we've always had um, – uh, an internet, uh, excuse me, a, a mobile or, or um, remote, I should say, a remote presence with our C20 groups. Although this year we plan to have like one big meetup, uh, maybe in Arkansas or someplace else, but that didn't, that's not going to come to fruition this year. But we have uh, our 20 groups are, you know, through Zoom. So we've been doing that for the last year already. So we were already set up for that. So um, when this came around, we had no problem with uh, uh, people being there. And then uh, I believe it was NCS. I mean, Kristen will yell at me if I have it wrong, but NCS uh, brought up uh, um, you know, some issues and they said, look, we're going to give you some money towards 
giving away some free classes for the 20 groups. And so more shops are able to come in on the, the estimating, the leadership, uh, technician, um, we finished, we started, and, and ownership. And now they'll, they, you know, they got a little taste of what it's like. And we've had some new people join up uh, onto the program. So that's worked out pretty well for us. And then, I see. You know, that, that, mm -hmm. that, that really didn't hurt business. My clients, uh, yeah, they're a little bit slower uh, than what they normally are, but they don't do a ton of cars anyway. I mean, my shop exclusive in New Jersey, we do about 670 cars a year. 680 someplace in that area six just under 700 cars you know but we're doing you know we're doing them at 13 five a car so you know we're doing seven eight million dollars a year um mid-island collision my main client that's uh like right near my house they're doing um you know they, they do about 1700 cars a year but they're doing 24 million dollars a year Correct. so you know uh, this doesn't hurt them that bad because one, they got money, plenty of money in the bank. Two, they're not busy but broke. They're not spinning their wheels and using money from the last five cars to pay these five cars and chasing their tails. That bill comes in, they pay it right then and there. They don't. They really don't have any revolving credit. They waste time with. They just pay the bill when it comes in. Um, and you know, now that they don't have to rely on so many cars, no one's been laid off. Actually, Mid Island hired, hired four new techs from other shops that they would have normally never have gotten mm -hmm. had this pandemic happen because those are the guys that were set in their ways. Uh, unfortunately, you, you, you leave your shop or your Joe superstar and you come over to Mid-Island Collision or, or even Exclusive Collision. Richie's the, the big star at um, Exclusive and then probably Lopez is the second big guy. And then you got Carmine, um, you know, at, at Mid-Island Collision, you know, and... Uh, Jose Castro and a, a few other good techs. Well, now you come in there, you would Joe, you know, you would Joe superstar at your shop. Now you're, you're you're on the all, you're on the Yankees. You know, you're on the Yankees from the 1950s that <laughs> won eight world championships. But you're not, you know, you're playing on a team with Lou Gehrig, uh, uh, um, you know, Joe DiMaggio, uh, Babe Ruth, all on one team now. So you're no longer the main superstar. So I mean, you know, that's uh. Uh, uh, an ego thing sometimes, and you're not going to get somebody that's going to leave a shop. But now they realize, I got a place to go. Guys are laying me off. And a lot of these were heavily DRP'd shops or mm -hmm. shops that, um, you know, were not DRP'd, but would go ahead and, you know, not fight insurance companies on anything. Always look the other way to uh, the way Kristen and I teach and, you know, the, the, the whole arguing with insurance companies on behalf of consumers and getting consumers involved. Well, you know, I'm laughing now that a lot of those shops are going out of business or they had to fire a lot of their people. And we see that with the, the big MSOs that are now refusing to pay their rent that are, um, you know, fired most of their management staff have one or two people at one location that load leveling your car 30 miles away to another location. I think that's uh, a little unfair it was a bad business uh, model to begin with, and it's only proven true that that you know house of cards they built on top of a foundation of sand is falling apart. They don't even want to pay their paint suppliers. You know, you you say that in Brooklyn where I'm not paying your rent. There's going to be three big guys going to show up at your shop the next day, and they're going to tell you you got to leave, or they're going to help you leave. It's your choice which way you want to go with this, but you're going to get tossed out of there. You know, Correct. and and, and you got people who you know. Um, you know, uh, somebody my age, or I'm, I'm 50, I'll be 53 in January, so I'm 52 and a half. So 52 years old and, you know, to 65. A lot of these guys were selling their body shops. You know, you're probably young enough to be my son in, in a way. So, like, I sold the body shop and I, I set you up that you're going to be a, a regional manager for them. You know what I mean? And so I'm going to collect the rent. And you still know you got a little bit of daddy's money when, when it's all said and done. But all of a sudden, daddy's not getting paid. And you can't open another shop for 10 years because that's the deal they make with you. So I'm like, uh, guess what? We're going to open another shop across the street. We're going to take all the workers they fired, and we're going to open up something else because you breached my contract. I'm going to breach your contract. What, are you kidding me? And this is going to become a nightmare. I'm telling you, the lawsuits are going to go crazy with a lot of these landlords. You know, I know, I know one particular shop group that sold out 12 shops, and he has a team of about 30 people that not only watch the body shop, buildings but he owns like five or six you know apartment complexes that these guys watch 
Well, now he's got a problem paying them, even though they're essential workers and have to do the work. But, mm -hmm. but what do you mean you're not paying my rent? I got a, I got a contract with you. Now you're not going to pay, and you're an essential business. This isn't like where you know you're you're, you're an antique store or you're uh, um. Uh, um, I don't know, you're a needlepoint store, you're a shoemaker, and you weren't listed as essential. You know what? Then, yes, the state should allow, the, the state or the government should push the banks to, you know, put your mortgage these three, four months on the back end of your mortgage. So if you got a 20-year mortgage, now you got a 24-year mortgage, but you didn't pay four months of it, and there's sure. no penalties. Then I can give free rent for those four months because I don't have to pay my mortgage. That's great. You know, and if I, ha if I own the buildings outright, I might give my tenants free you know free rent i'd be like you know what they're great tenants i don't want to lose them you know what free rent you know but that's a choice i want to make don't tell me you especially when you're a billion dollar company you know that that's the problem that's the big you're not talking a mom and pop shop here you're talking some big conglomerate that yep. is, is, is saying we can't pay our rent we're too broke well then obviously your business model sucks <laughs> you know your, your your gross profit uh, your net profit it, 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 and, and your gross profit is almost the same number you know, and that's the problem with these things, and that's what they don't realize. And you know, these are shops that are that are doing cars for about twenty-five to thirty-two hundred dollars a vehicle, and that's uh, you know, I I used to compare Mid Island Collision to a shop I knew in the the Northeast area that had twelve locations, different shop that I'm talking about beforehand, and they were doing about twenty-four million dollars a year. Also, uh, Mid Island has about forty, forty-three, forty-four employees across three businesses. A towing company with three or four people, uh, uh, a mechanic, uh, a company with uh, three or four people in it, and the rest is the body shop. And um, they, they each have a different name. Uh, but I'm going to include that all as one whole big unit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other place had uh, 12 locations, two, $24 million a year, like 280 employees. But, you know, Mid Island does 1,700 cars for $24 million. This shop was doing like 11,000 cars for $24 million. Which equated to like, you know, 1900 a car they're doing it for. Mm -hmm. You're busy but broke. You're never catching up. You know, that's the problem. As soon as work slows up, like we have now, you're seeing these shops not knowing what to do. They're falling apart. They can't figure anything out. They're, they're, they're having issues. Uh, you know, probably some of the small mom and pop shops that do government service agency GSA work are probably doing okay because checks are still coming in from three months ago that they did work, and now they're getting paid on it. So they're, they're surviving on money that, that's coming in that's still owed to them. That's one good thing. But once you cut off work for a lot of these shops, they don't know what to do. They don't have, you know, they don't have a backlog. They're trying to get cars out as fast as possible. You know, when, when clients like uh, uh, that work with Collision Hub usually have a backlog filled in their parking lot because they, you know, cars are unsafe to drive. I and mean, we don't care about rental time, you know, a cycle time. Yeah, that, that's not our problem. We're, we're, our cycle time at most of our clients is about 25 days. That, that, that's what the cycle time is because it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's repairing the car the proper way. The car's not safe to drive. It's not driving off the property. You know, we'll throw you in a rental. We'll do something. We'll work it out with you. And we're going to talk, you know, about that. Um, I especially, you know, ask my guys to be on this one tonight. Um, uh, you know, since the conversation with Kristen, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, that I, you know, honestly, I technically discovered you guys like that way. And, uh, it's been a, a completely change in perspective and the way that I'm, you know, looking over my business. And, um, so let's come, you know, to today's day, you know, right now, um, Last thing that I've seen, you know, from, from your, you know, social networks and stuff like that, uh, uh, this famous Mercedes-Benz, you know, that you posted. Um, and maybe, oh, you know, the, uh, a the C CL, uh, C uh, CL, uh, the GLC uh, AMG model, 43. Yes, the, yeah. the glass situation and all that, which, you know, we're going to cover it now. But I think that one, you know, it probably covers, you know, everything from start to finish. Uh, what you can do wrong and why we should do stuff in a different way. Um, so if you want to tell, you know, for everyone that, you know, haven't seen that video, what was all that about? Well, that, that, uh, uh I posted two videos, one a few days ago and one, one today, uh, the second part of it when we cut out some of the glass that's on there. And what had happened was it's a, it's a repeat customer at Mid Island Collision. And this particular person with this car had a Benz before this that was involved in a collision. 
uh, got damaged and um, totaled out. And uh, Mid Island Collision arranged for them to work out with their sponsored Mercedes Benz shop, which is uh, Mercedes Benz of um, Rockville Center. So they sent the person over there, and he decided he was. I, I think he went from a, G, a GLE, a little bit bigger of a truck, but a, a standard model, a 350. Uh, and he went to this uh, GLC, which is a little bit smaller, but it's an AMG, a little more expensive, about $75,000, this truck, the way he had it. Uh, he doesn't have all the ADAS system stuff in it. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing he does have is the um, the headlight dimmer and uh, the rain sensor and the windshield. doesn't have all the other stuff uh, that's there. And um, Mid-Island, funny enough, when you total out a car at Mid-Island Collision, when a car gets totaled out, they pay your first month. You know, he was um, he was uh, uh, ecstatic, you know, and he sent like two or three people over there. So now he I, and I, I didn't get the story exactly. So I might be off on this. Either his sister or his girlfriend had a big fight with him. And he's only got like 800 miles on this truck. And they had this whole big argument. And she takes a brick to the truck and starts beating the crap out of the windshield, breaks the two uh, driver's side um, front door and rear door windows and then breaks the back uh, um, window. Now, the brick breaks in a couple of pieces. When she broke the back window, she dented the deck lid. She dented the door a little bit. She threw one of the rocks on top of the roof, so that dented a couple of spots in the roof. What's going on? And then calls his, uh, calls his glass company, you know, calls up his uh, insurance company, says, I'm sending it to Mid-Island Collision. And they said, okay, um, we have a problem with that shop. They charge too much. He says, yeah, well, I really don't care. Well, we're going to send a truck to your house to do glass work in your driveway. And, okay, you know, it's so, funny. I, I posted but, Larry, Yes. let's pause there for a second. The insurance says I have a problem with that shop. It charged too much. Yeah. Can we elaborate a yes. little bit about that concept? <laughs> Uh, they basically hate Mid-Island Collision, much like they said it about Exclusive Collision and probably other shops that aren't a direct repair shop. But there's certain shops they really do despise, and most of them are my clients in whatever state they might be in. Okay. So they, they're really unhappy. Okay. Um, yeah, it's the problem is, and this is where people don't realize this, and Erica Eversman, myself, and Kristen have talked about this a lot. It's next to impossible to show steering. Uh, um, you know, the insurance company could say go to this shop, or you have to go there, or you have to do it. You to sue for steering, you have to show a loss of revenue, which is impossible. You're not going to be able to show it. You just can't do it. It's just going to be impossible to show a loss of revenue from that car. You'd need 150 cars to be taken away from you and probably go into debt to be able to prove that they're systematically uh, screwing you to get cars out of your shop or cars away from your shop. So well, we get this all the time. We told customers this, and the guy's like, the car's still going to mid on collision. You want to come and do the glass, do the glass. So the guy comes down to do the glass at his house, and I'm, you know, uh, on a tangent real quick. I had posted on uh, these videos on a, a, a glass group that I was asked to post it on. Uh, somebody who runs the group asked me to post on there. And it's worse than Collision Repair Technicians United. It's horrible on there with uh, the, 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 the real glass guys being like real body men. You know, I'm not a detailer. I'm not supposed to clean glass. I, I just install glass. Not my problem. This is all I get paid. I got a family to feed. It's all this crap. And it's like, you know, I get cursed out because, you know, I don't like mobile glass companies. I don't. I'm not a mobile glass fan. I don't care what kind of glue you use, you know. Well, I follow all the right procedures. Okay, so you use all the different glues from all the different manufacturers. No, I use one glue. Well, that's the problem right there. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's an issue. So um, back on that, they do the glass work and stuff. And, you know, the guys complain. What about the glass in the dashboard? He says, that ain't my problem. And this is some big national code. You notice I don't mention names. Unless it's mm -hmm. my client, I mention names. I don't mention names, other things. But this is a big national client in the area that does this glass work. And he's like, yeah, I'm not doing it, you know. He didn't clean the glass out of the, out of the doors. Um, the back door, as you saw in the first video, he didn't even bolt the glass on. So the glass just floats up and down automatically by itself. Um, 
the backlash he should have never put in because well we got to cut it out again because it's it, the dent is the damage is right underneath the glass that's there so why would you you know so it didn't make sense and this is the stupidity they went through so now of course this particular insurance company is blowing a gasket that we went ahead and you know we, we have this vehicle that's in the shop it's already been taken apart in the second video you see glass is cut out of it and they're already flipping out and you know going nuts with it and we really don't care which way they want to go with this i want to total we'll get the guy another car it really doesn't matter to us you know, guys only got 800 miles on it. You know, it's not, you know, not a big thing. It's a lease car anyway. So, but I mean, you know, I have microscopic and uh, uh, macroscopic photos of glass embedded in the dash that's not coming out. I have macroscopic and microscopic photos of the suede center of the seat because it's got leather on the side and suede leather in the middle that's got glass embedded in it. I have videotape of... Um, the technician at the shop trying to vacuum it out with a vacuum and then me taking more photos that it's still in there. You're not getting it all out. So snowball and Bobby's crazy enough that he's going to post this everywhere. Like, uh, I mean, once the Yankee game stood up, he might put this whole report as TV commercial on the Yankee network. That'll be across the country. He does. That's how crazy he is. He doesn't care. He's fighting for the consumer. It's almost like the Robin Hood of uh, collision repair in a way. So I will assume that, you know, and I'm all about, you know, I agree with 100%, you know, that we should all follow, you know, OEM procedures and all that. And uh, what is the percentage of the industry that you think that is actually following that? And what's the percentage that it doesn't? Uh, I would say probably 5 to 7% of the industry follows OEM repair procedures 85% of the time, there's probably the 1% that follows it, you know, 98% of the time. But most of the other ones are just crapshoots. I mean, I had a, a pick a tech question today. Once again, I don't mention shop names or anything like that, but I had a pick a tech question that came in on a, a 20, uh, 2018 uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee that the shop did a repair to. And, and you know, pick a tech works great if you give us information. If I got to pull teeth, it gets annoying. Uh, and I know Kristen feels that way, and so does Jason when we do Pekatech. So, they, you know, they send in that. It's a 2018 uh, um, Jeep Grand Cherokee, which is basically identical to my uh, uh, Dodge uh, Durango. And, you know, mine's fully loaded with all the ADAS systems in it. Well, this becomes an issue that um, they show me a picture of the dashboard that says, you know, you have to clean or remove what's ever covering the bumper cover. Uh, in the back, and the, and, and the person asks, um, well, do I have to change the sensors? I said, well, what codes are there? Well, I don't know. Okay, what'd you do to the car? Well, we changed the bumper. Why'd you change a bumper? Well, it needed a bumper. But why does it need a bumper? What kind of damage was there? What else did you do? So, oh, no, it was just a bumper cover that got, you know, scraped and scratched up. And Okay, is it a new bumper or you repaired it? No, it's a new bumper. Did you make any mistakes in the shop that you had to repaint the bumper again? Well, that could affect it. Yeah, it could. What's the mill thickness on the bumper? Well, I don't have a mill gauge for that. Okay, then go find out if the painter painted it more than once. Because if he messed it up and then he put more paint on it, that could be a possibility. That'll block it? Yes, it will block it. Um, and I said, make sure they're plugged in. Well, I have to take the bumper off for that. Okay, then point the phone at the, the, the car. I'll tell you if it's plugged in or not. Because I'll use my mental telepathy. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um... I, I mean, I didn't say that in Picatech, but I'm thinking this to myself. Okay, so, I mean, this is like pulling teeth on this. And uh, what it came down to was they, um, you know, so I said, it's a new bump, but did you send it for recalibration at the dealership? No, we didn't. I said, well, it probably needs to be recalibrated, providing the plugs are plugged in, they're plugged in properly. Okay, then texts me back on Picatech. Oh, we found out it's an aftermarket bumper. Okay. Um, here's the easy fix. Take the bumper off, throw it in the garbage, buy a brand new bumper, repaint that, put it on, send it to the dealer for recalibration, car will be fixed fine. And they got, you know, lots of laugh. Okay, terrific, you know. But, I, I, I mean, the, for that car, and I know because of my truck that I wrote the estimates for when it got hit in the rear, there was um, 78 pages to change my, my, my rear deck lid and my, my rear bumper cover. 
and we sent it to the dealer uh, for all the resets. And when they were done, uh, my memory uh, one and two wasn't working. My button for my door handle for the keyless entry, because you just touch the door and it opens up automatically the handle, and then you press the little button on the door handle to lock it, that wasn't working. So I called up the dealer. I said, what is this? Oh, we probably have to re-reset. What part of we sent it to you to do the resets and the recalibration, don't you understand? I'm coming down there. I'm going to make sure you do it. Oh, what are you doing down here? I'm coming down there because obviously you screwed up the first time. Now I don't trust you. So now I got to watch you do it to make sure you do it the right way. Or I'll do it for you. Just give me your laptop computer, you know, with the proprietary information in it. And all it was was a reset on that. But you charged us already for the reset. Oh, that was just for the for the rear hatch and the and and the and the um you know the blind spot detector. What part of do all resets don't you? What part of all didn't you understand? You know, and that that's the problem. You have problems with dealerships that do this. So in certain areas, mobile guys with the proper equipment are better than dealerships, and then in other areas, dealerships are better than mobile guys. It you know right. you're getting it all over the place. And I noticed it now with the glass guys are just as crazy. You know, with, with, with stupid stuff. And then, you know, we, we recently got, once again, I don't mention names, but everyone knows who I'm talking about. Collision Repair Technicians United. Mark Gabbard let this lunatic on there that claims he's the, the world's greatest frame tech. And this guy's just, he's not even like, oh, he makes Arthur Terzik look like he's, uh, um, he's, a, he's an engineer for Mercedes-Benz. And he's making the repair procedures for Mercedes-Benz. That's how bad this guy is. And... Mm. He's making up his own sectioning locations. He's not only cutting quarter panels in half, he's cutting like slivers out of quarter panels and rocker panels. And, and then he's arguing on Facebook and yelling at Kristen, you know, that she doesn't know what she's talking about. He builds the best cars in the world. He's the greatest frame tech ever. It's <laughs> nuts. You know, I mean, it, it, this isn't it. And like, he's not even using the excuse. Well, I've been in the business for 35 years because he looks like he's 28 or 30 years old. Um, you know, he's not using the excuse. I'm married and I got to put, you know, food in the mouths of my kids. No, he really thinks he's that great. That's the crazy part about this. This lunatic thinks he's that great of a, of a body tech that he's just making up his own sectioning procedures. You know, he's cutting pieces out. And I like Arthur. And while they're back, he's getting used pieces. But then he's heating stuff up. I mean, it, it's just... An, and the videos are all over Collision Repair Technicians United. You probably know what I'm talking about. But I don't mention names. And, and it's it's crazy. It's really, really nuts what's going on. And, you know, to repair a car properly from dealing with shops that are on the real OEM programs, the, the, the German programs, what I call the real OEM programs, ones you actually have to go to hands-on training, ones you actually have to prove yourself in class, the ones that actually have restricted parts, not this rubber stamp crap that comes around um, with, the, with these bull crap inspections and, and no uh, support at whatsoever from the OEM. you got no one to call it the OEM like you know Chrysler and Ford and anybody else. Um, GM, uh, you actually have someone at the at the manufacturer uh, collision program you can call and speak to and actually get an answer on something. And, you know, working with those shops, the cars are easy to work on. People tell me all the time, oh, Mercedes-Benz website, uh, WIS is very difficult to use, and, and their cars are nightmares to work on. German cars are the easiest cars to work on, and WIS is probably the easiest simplest uh, 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 OEM website to use. Even easier than the ones that just print out a PDF manual. They're even easier because everything's hyperlinked and you can go back to where you were just off the one sheet. Just um, remove bumper cover and on the bumper cover is going to give you all the links to every single document you need to take that bumper off and put it back on again. And including the electronic stuff. Everything's on there. What has to be aimed, what tools you need, everything. Once you understand how to work it, um, it's the easiest program to use. Just like once you learn uh, how to think like a German and the way the Mercedes-Benz guys mm -hmm. um, want you to think, or BMW or Audi or Porsche, it's very simple to work on those vehicles. They are really so, made very, very simple. So, um, you know, I kind of wanted to start from the beginning, but I think it's going to be too crazy to go from the, the whole process. Well, whatever but, you want to go, tell me. No, <laughs> but, but, you know, in regards to this, like, and I know that you also post, you know, I've seen like this Audi, you know, 2015 with 2,500 pages to go over. I'm missing that part. Like what happened, like when you do a research and you do find that you're going to go through 2,500 pages 
and you got to translate that to the technician and you know Kristen mentioned you know how you know a bad job we're doing on making the information digestible what happened in that portion like what is your your you know, well, procedures back, on that back q5 now the that the, the the okay the reason i printed all that page those pages out the nine or ten reams of paper i needed for it was that's going to court that's a court case i got put off right now because it was a continuance no excuse me an adjournment and then we had to wait and then the coronavirus happened so this is going to be postponed for a while we pr i printed it out um really it's eyewash to bring into the into the courtroom and it's going to be used and the pages are highlighted with little like the uh, lawyer gives you a little sign stick it notes that he puts on there that's for each one of the pages for my lawyer because i can't you know question anybody in a court but the lawyer is going to ask you know the um the adjuster and the manager you know what's this what's that where's this where's that well here it is right here show me where it says that show me this show me that so he's going to have all that ammunition i don't just give him uh, uh, one clip with a hundred rounds in it. No, I'm giving him a, 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 an armory of Scud missiles, Patriot missiles, mm -hmm. uh, 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 um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, fighter jets, aircraft carriers, bombs, nuclear bombs, uh, uh, air, you know, uh, surface to air missiles, Sherman tanks. Uh, M1 tanks, Abram tanks, I'm the Panzer tanks. I'm giving him everything, so he's ready to go when he gets there to court, and he can go up against any uh, anybody that the insurance company throws at him. And then when I get up there, because all the pages are highlighted, I know uh -huh. where to go for that. For that repair, that technician, or even me, because I've done a few of those cars, you know, maybe I'm on there for an hour. I know which manuals to go to. Now. The funny thing is all the electrical manuals. Now, if you really looked closely at the videos or even some of the pictures I put, they'll like some of the electric manuals list nine different, you know, ranges of cars. It'll list the Q5, the Q7, the Q8, the A6, the A4. It'll be listed all down there because they're all using the same freaking system. The, the domino or the big whiteboard with all the little black dots on it that Audi uses to do their backup cameras, their park sensors, and the, and the um, lane departure, blind, sense, blind, blind spot sensors, that's the same procedure for all their vehicles that have that equipment in it. So it's one manual that's accessed through whatever car you pick. So, so you have done it, you already... You so know. you kind of know what page to look at. You know, it's 139 to 164 is where the... But we don't give a shit about that because we're not doing it. We sent it to the dealer. So we're done with that. So I don't need that one. I needed all this for proof. So like I said, it might have been 2,800 pages or, you know, 2,900 pages, but we're only using, you know, uh, really in essence for the repair, you only need 500 pages. And of the 500 pages, I probably only needed 300 that actually... Uh, uh, told me what I needed to do to the car. Now you got to realize the rear body panel is a lot of pictures like hieroglyphics with some explanation. Once you've read them and know the explanation, you don't have to keep looking back. It's like, what's this symbol for? What's that symbol for? I, you know, mm -hmm. I had to print all that out. So now I can narrow that down. You probably need 150 pages once you've done it 10, 15 times. Because you can do away with some of the hieroglyphics or the key, the key page, like what's this uh, icon is or what the... And they all use the same friggin' seam sealer. They all use mm. the same friggin' glue. You know, you're using the same resistance welder. I don't have to look at any of this stuff. I know this stuff already. It's the same friggin' model. You know, excuse me, it's the same, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 manufacturer. So we're using all this stuff here. So we got, you know, a box full of A that's for every single car they make. I don't have to look that up again. So it was exaggerated to show people, this is what happens when you go to court. And listen, we've coached people uh, from shops about going to court. Body shop guys make some of the worst experts in court that you've ever seen in your life. Because they, they, they don't know how to testify properly. They, they try to speak body shop lingo. And, you know, the, a lot of them are uh, of that opinion of, well, I've been told this for years, so it's got to be true, so I'm going with this, and can't back it up, which is part of the problem why they can't talk to customers or talk to insurance companies or be able to explain why they have to do something. And then I come in, or Kristen comes in, and all of a sudden we're getting paid for all sorts of stuff, and they're like, 
why couldn't I do that? Well, that's yeah, you don't have any. Yeah. You got to learn a different way of thinking. You know, uh, it's kind of like when I, I do post repair inspections and I'll, I'll do it over the phone with somebody. And, you know, we come in, we do QRAs, which is quality repair assessments. That's where you actually have to write a legal report and I got to prove why it's wrong. Now I come in and the shop's like 98% there or 95% there he's right. I'll find a few more things he didn't realize, but they can't explain why it's wrong. Well, that resistance weld isn't good. Well, why? Well, does it have enough penetration? Okay, how do you prove it? You know, remember, in a court of law, it's not what you think, it's what you can prove. And it's how you prove it and how you present it. And you have to be able to back it up. Like, you can go into court and you can bring out, well, why are you doing this? Well, ICAR said this, the OEM says this, the database system said this. Oh, and I have this article from Mike Anderson and Larry Montanez. And that can be your proof. You can go in like that. I can't go in with my own article. If I go in with my own articles, yeah, I might be an expert because I've written a lot of articles to the industry and I've been peer-reviewed, peer but I can't use my own articles in court because it falls under what they call the ipsy dipsy rule. Just because you say it doesn't make it so. Correct. So I can't use it. But if you brought it up in court as a fact witness or the guy who worked on the car and then he brings it up, I can be cross-examined or examined by our own attorney that'll say, hey, Mr. Martinez, or if I'm, you're on, we're on opposite sides, you're, you know, my attorney could bring up on the cross-examination of it and go, wait a second, you brought this up. Well, Mr. Martinez, didn't you write that? Yeah, I did write that. All. Is he interpreting that correctly? See, that's how that can get in. I can't bring it. Well, why'd you do that? Well, because of this. Well, didn't you write that? Yeah. Well, that's not admissible in court. And that's the, the, the big difference there. So that, that whole bunch of paperwork was printed out, as we call eyewash. It's for the jury. It's for the judge. It's for the other side. It unnerves people. You see that much paperwork. Mm -hmm. And, oh, you don't need that many papers. Well, I got to need all these manuals. We don't need to, I didn't say I had to print them out, but I can't show on a computer. Because on a computer, you scroll through the pages. You don't get the depth of how much you're actually going through when you scroll and the screen just moves. I print out 10 inches of paper. You're like, wow, that I got to carry in a box. And you see, I'm kind of struggling, <laughs> lifting up, you know, it's a case of paper. You know, you, you've, I'm sure you've gotten cases of paper delivered to your shop or anyone else who's on here watching this has got, it's heavy. So picture carrying that. Remember, you're carrying it from the parking lot across the street through the radar, you know, through the, uh, the the metal detector and all that stuff, up the you know up the court steps, through the uh, the elevator sometimes, and then to the courtroom. You got to carry this. That's a pain in the ass carrying that paper, you know. And it and then you put it down on the desk, and you know what that's going to sound like? The bump. <laughs> you know, you you're putting an act on sometimes in court. You you know that's why you wear a suit and tie to court. If you're a criminal, you always see them in a suit and tie. When they're being arraigned, unless something really bad happened, and then they're in the orange jumpsuit, but they're in a suit and tie. They're clean shaven, like you see sometimes these um, uh, um, these protesters. They got the big hairy beards and stuff like that, big bro. But all of a sudden, he's in there and he's got his hair slicked back. He's got no beard on, and now he's in like you know a thousand dollar suit. He's like, oh, he looks like a nice kid. Well, you know, they show you a picture of what he looked like that day. He looks like a mass murderer, and then all of a sudden he's in court, and he looks all great. You know, it's kind of like any any kid that gets shot in the inner city. They always show his high school graduation or his confirmation picture. It's like, hey, where's the bandana backwards with the gangbanger with the gun? I mean, you know, where was that? Um, so, you know, the, 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 it's, it's, it's the presentation you put on. You're putting an act on in court, so you have to present yourself the right way. So, you know, I'm coming in there with this stuff to try and scare the other side or make them uneasy. That's my job. My attorney's job, uh, my, my attorney client, I should say, uh, job is to make sure that I train him for the stuff that he doesn't know about collision repair. So Mid-Island Collision has gotten everybody that is their lawyer, same thing with exclusive, that I've, they've sat down and been trained on estimating for me. They've been sat down and trained on uh, um, the P pages from all three systems. They've also been trained from me on the law. And what I mean by the law is how it's interpreted, the state laws, the state um, unfair claims practice acts, how they're interpreted by the insurance company to consumers and what we've seen in court already. So that they're prepared and go, wait a second, because instead of letting something slide by, they'll hear that and they'll go, hang on a second, you're incorrect, Your Honor, that's incorrect. 
Correct. You know, and they'll bring it up. And that's that's where why their attorneys are so much better than what these other guys, uh, especially insurance companies, are utilizing lately that I've noticed. They don't have that training. They don't know the lingo. They don't know the body shop terminology that's being used. And they don't know the lies that are being told. I mean, listen, I've had attorneys from the other side tell me outright lies. And I know it came from the insurance company, told them, well, this is this, this, and this. Okay, they never checked the law. And I'll be in court and I'll go, um, no, that's false. Oh, you're saying that's false? That's the law. No, New York State Insurance Law 2610 stipulates this, not what you just said. This is what it's, and the judge will go, he's right. And they look really bad to the jury, you know. And I, you know, of course, I'll try and get away with stupid shit in court, and I'm really good at it because I talk fast. So, you know, I'll be like, no, this is what it stipulates, and the judge might interject which they do sometimes, like, no, Mr. Martinez is correct. I said, did you even read the law before you asked me the question? And the jury will laugh. Once I get a jury to laugh, I know, well, we won the case. I know the case is won. It's, it, it, this, is, this is a slam dunk because you got this guy looking like an idiot. And I've had them go off on tangents because they didn't study the, the information. And what I do on my side for my client attorneys is I try and tell them how I would win this case if I was working the other side, but they never get anybody good enough on the other side. A lot of times they'll bring their own DRPs in and they just outright lie. I mean, I have one that came in to try to testify against us and because mid Island and exclusive do a lot of post repair inspections. We brought out the files, 350 files against one shop over seven years on cause they bought back. Not that we re-repaired, because they had the buy that the insurance company bought back on their behalf to get rid of it. Um, you know, I, we had a case one time where, because I work for the engineer's office and we do fraud investigations and stuff, we have one particular company that I can't do work for anymore because of this. And um, the guy was <laughs> up at the stand, and you know, um, he's talking about how I don't know what I'm talking about in this case, and that I'm wrong, and that I'm incorrect with this, and I'm going out on a limb, and I'm no longer an ICAR instructor, and blah, 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 blah. So mid Allen's attorney says, let me ask you a question. Do you know Lying Technical Services? And he's like, well, yes. Does Lying Technical Services you know, do fraud investigation? Yes. Has Lying Technical Services been doing this for X amount of years? Yes, they have. Do you know Mr. Montanez to work for that company? Well, yes, I do. And has Mr. Montanez done any work for your company uh, through Lang Technical Services? Well, I believe he has done some. Would you say it's 685 jobs in the last two years? Well, if that's what you have on paper, then I'm going to have to say yes. Now, you also stipulated that you stated earlier that you're in charge of all the SIU cases and that you have to sign the checks to get paid out and you review the reports. Yes. Of those 635 cases that Mr. Martinez did on behalf of your company through Lang Technical Services on fraud investigations where you thought there was some sort of fraud or the act uh, um, didn't match up, did the collision damage didn't match up with the story that was given, how many of those cases went to court? I don't recall. If I told you none, would you believe that? Well, if you have it on paper, then I'm going to have to believe you. And of the 635 cases Mr. Montanez did in the last two years for your company through Lang Technical, how many times did you disagree with them? I really don't recall. Would that be none because you paid every single case and you didn't have to go to court on any of them? Well, I'd have to agree with that. So Mr. Montanez was right 635 times when he worked for you, but he's wrong this one time because he's working for a body shop. They eventually won the case on a bunch of other stuff, but this is how bad it looks when you lie. So he would have been smarter to say, yeah, well, I just don't agree with Mr. Montanez's premonition. Uh, he, he's right about this or this, but, and then say on opinion factors, not facts. And that's what Correct. kills these guys. <clears throat> they allow their ego and pride to get involved, just like you see the arguments on Collision Repair Technicians United or this other glass thing. Pride and ego get in the way. Nobody likes to be wrong. They don't like to be told they're wrong. They don't want to tell, be told that they're doing it the wrong way. And some of our best clients are the people that are like, you know what? Eight years ago, that was me. I think Mark Gabbard just put up a post from like five years ago, um, six years ago. And he had done something with James Moore, my, my former partner who passed away. And he posted a picture of a fender, a door 
that uh, a bumper cover and a fender and a, a blend into a door. He's like, oh, I got $2,200 for this. This is great. You know, I did this, this, mm -hmm. and this. And Mark's like, what an idiot I was. He now posts the memory. He goes, what an idiot I was. I get 9000 for that job now. <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. And it's funny because <clears throat> these guys will admit what I did wrong. You know what I mean? And not, you know, not be, not have an ego about it or an attitude. And listen, some of our best clients, I'll be honest with you, some of our close, closest clients, closest friends in this industry right now are guys I had, guys or even girls I had drag out wars with, you know, literally threatening me and stuff like that. You know, you come down here, I'll fly down. They give me your address. Post your address, I'll come down. I really don't care. I could use a good ass kicking. I need, I need to be in the hospital for about a month or so. <laughs> help me with a little bit of weight loss. It'll help me relax a little bit. I could probably catch up on some emails because I got like 1,800 emails in like five different accounts. So just, you know, so I don't have to do anything. I just get paid. I get paid to be in the hospital. I got disability insurance. So please, I, I need a good ass kicking. And, um, you know, and then all of a sudden it turns around and they realize, oh, you were right. Oh, can I have help now? <laughs> I got one guy who can't stand me, hates my guts, but to this day still calls me for advice because he respects my, my, my advice, doesn't like the way I give it to him. <laughs> it I'm happens. Saying... But you know, I, I, the guy's not phony, so I, I, I give the guy an answer. He's not phony. I don't like you. And he sent his car to my shop a couple of times, you know, that uh, uh, exclusive. It, well, you guys do good work, but you hate me. Yeah, but you do good work. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, I can respect that. You know, at least you're honest with me. You didn't change your attitude to change your way because of who I am or who I'm related to or anything like that. It's a hey, great. You know what? You hate me, but you know the shop I work with, or you know I'm going to do the right thing by you, and you can still hate me. That's great. I, I have a lot of respect for somebody that can still say to my face, I don't like you. That's great. As long as you say it to my face and not, you know, play keyboard tough guy. I, I got it. it. <laughs> um, I just want to say hi to Christina. She's just uh, popping. You missed that Larry basically didn't say any bad word in 45 minutes. Um, I don't. She's the one who screws up all the time. <laughs> say, listen, on my rants, I'll curse. On my 20 groups, I'll curse a little bit because the guys egg me on. Uh, my, <laughs> my rants, I curse. On the videos for Collision Hub, I've never screwed up. Doug Craig has said two curses on them on live. And Kristen has screwed up so many filmings of cursing for no reason whatsoever. Dropping the, and yeah, I'll go with the F bomb thing, you know, fudge. She said fudge numerous times that we had to restart videos again. I don't screw them up, she does. And you'd be, you'd be surprised. You'd think it would be me, but it's her. Even Mark Olson screwed up a couple of them. Me? No, I don't screw them up. There you go. <laughs> so, Larry, you know, I, I think it's a lot of confusion also. And, uh, with, with independent shops, you know, how to handle insurance. And it, I know that there's different situations. And, um, but before we go that route, I just want to say, okay. you know, when, when you were talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, that job that you guys got, you know, you celebrate that you did, or that guy did like $2,000 and you can get 9,000 today. Um, I was telling to my guys today when we were like, when we discovered that we can charge, that we could charge an administration fee, we discovered that and it was like, it, you know, it blew our mind. We were like, oh my God, we can charge like 75 bucks in, a, in an administration fee and it's okay they're agreeing with that? Oh my well, God. <laughs> once again, you, you know, I'll tell anybody, for whatever fees you want to charge, always look to your state laws, rules, and regulations. You know, it's different if you're on a tow program. And I'm not talking DRP type stuff. I'm talking for the city, town, state, whatever you're doing. You have the highway for this section. You're allowed to pick cars up on a rotation tow for accidents or, uh, excuse me, DOP programs, direct accident response uh, uh, team. Uh, whatever the case may be, you're stuck to certain things. Like I know some shops, well, you know, if I pick a car up off the street or off an accident, the first three days are free. The next three days are $10 a day. Every day after that is $15 a day, up to 30, up to 30 days that I can keep the car, and then I got to take it to the pound. So, you know, this stuff you get locked into. But take all that away. Check your state laws, rules, and regulations, number one. Number two Check also what you're allowed to charge for indoor versus outdoor storage. That's become an issue. Now, New York State, and a lot of shops get away with it. New York State, uh, the DMV, which is who actually governs body shops, not the state insurance department. And that's in every state. The state insurance department, I have not found a state yet that the state insurance department governs a body shop at all. Can't say anything to them. 
has nothing to do with them. That's for insurance companies only. Health, life, property. That's all. Has nothing to do with body shops. Body shops are governed by a licensing board. Listen, I know one state that the agricultural uh, 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 board covers body shops, beauty shops, food services. It's like a licensing bureau. Sometimes it's a licensing bureau. So there's somebody that governs you. Know your rules and regulations. Now, for example, in New York State, I tell people, calculate what your value is for the spot you're giving up per day. Because you're an operating business, you're not just a big empty lot. But don't have a difference between indoor and outdoor storage because someone could say to you, remember, this is consumer protection. Who are you to choose where the car is going to be? Unless the customer gives you specifically in writing, the car has to be inside, up in the air, and I want it wrapped in plastic. That's a different story, and you'd have to give them a upfront pricing of what that is just like your labor rates are supposed to be on something you give the customer when they drop the car off and whatever agreement you know you must pick up your car two days after we're finished with it otherwise storage charges begin whatever the case may be you have to give that up front and then some documentation has to be done what i don't like about new york state versus other states you can use a phone call for approvals versus you don't have to have a text you don't have to have uh something written assigned for so making a phone log is a very important thing if you do it because you really got to show, well, on this date, I called this person at this time. Well, if they pull their phone records, you know, which is usually your phone bill at the end of the month, you can see, well, here's a phone call from this number, and your office said, what are you doing on the phone with the shop for seven minutes? Mm-hmm. And they got in their log that they called you on that day. So it's just by chance they spent seven minutes on the phone with you? On Correct. that particular day between these particular times, they wrote it down. So, you know, there's a little bit of... You know, the judge wants to see you do something. How many times you walk up? Well, I called the guy. When did you call him? Well, I don't remember. You can't go into court like that. That's why, like Kristen talks about it all the time. I talk about it. Documentation, photographs, writing things down. It's so very important. So your state laws for your shop, who governs your shop, your licensing, um, is very important. Also, it's important because you live in that state is to know your insurance laws, not only for your consumers, or your customers, but for you also. So you need to understand um, the fair, Unfair Claims Practice Act or uh, uh, Fair Claims Settlement Practice Act, whatever they're calling it, but you got to look that type of stuff up and read it and see exactly. I mean, I've shops have called me. It's like, well, the insurance company has been down for two weeks. Okay, what's your state law say? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're 48 years old. You've been involved in this business for 30 years. I know that already. And you don't know what your state law is on how many days they have to come down on the initial inspection on a first-party claim? Yeah, no. All right, call me back when you know it because I can't answer because I'm not looking it up because I'm going to send you a very big bill if I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? And that, uh, you know, I have no problem telling somebody where to, where to find the best drink, which is the best drink to have when you get there. I'll even pay for the drink sometimes, but I'm not going to go drink it for you. You got to go drink yourself, and, and that's what the, that's the problem with this industry. Everybody wants them to hand them everything and then get a note. You want me to come over there and do the work for you? Too? I mean, a few years back, that we we had such a rash out on on Repair Technicians United that I was posted up. Who wants to come over and mow my lawn, do my laundry, <laughs> pick up the poop after my dogs, rub my feet for me, make me dinner, and then go home just because uh, I'm asking for it? Oh, you know, you're being a jerk like, well, that's what you guys want. You want me to give you the procedure. You want me to loan you my rivet gun. You want me to loan you the glue. And then, you know, basically, well, you know what? why don't I just come to your shop, do the friggin' job for you, and you just sit there on a lawn chair and just watch me? How about that? You keep all the money. I'll do it for free. You, you know, then that's the ridiculousness that's gotten into this business where nobody wants to do anything for themselves. And that's where this lays off on. And then you get these questions from people. And it's like, okay, I'm not even, in your, how do I know your state laws? I'm not in your state. Well, the best is I had an argument the other night with somebody about something. Well, you don't understand what goes on in this state. I'm licensed in your state. I'm licensed in like 30 something states, which is a ridiculous amount of money because each one's either 50 or $100 a year to register. So I'm spending all this money to be licensed in these states for really one or two cases a year. And I'm like, but I'm licensed in your state. So are you licensed in your own state? No. Then what are you talking about? You're arguing with somebody that knows the law and you don't. You know, so what are you arguing about? You're doing it wrong. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. Insurance company can't dictate to you what to put on the car on a third party, especially on a third party claim. So do you think that uh, eventually that 1% that is uh, doing it right, whatever you, you know, 90 something percent you say, and, and that 5% that is doing it like 85% right all the time, do you think that is going to 
increase that's going in the right direction. It seems like very low numbers right now, but do you see an improvement or do you see that that's kind of stuck there uh, and, you know, it's not going anywhere or it's going very slowly or it's going backwards, but don't answer that right now because Instagram is going to kick us out. <laughs> so I'm going to call you right